Aloha. Thank you, Ren, for those reminders. What a Christian is not, and we are not just good people. We are not just religious people, <laughs> or more than that. And I like that last point, too, because there are those who go about calling themselves Christians that follow the old law instead of the new law, right? If you follow the old law, you are a Judaizer, not a Christian, right? And so that's important. One of those important divisions in Scripture that is often missed. Um, it's good to see you. I'm encouraged by your presence it's a beautiful day to be here uh, to worship our Father in heaven. And I want to say this soccer season is back on for our kiddos. So yesterday was their first day. Um, uh, it was opening day, and we ended with a scrimmage with a tie. So uh, it, was, it was good to see the kids. So if you want to come and see our, our soccer team with I-9 Sports, that will be uh, our first game. Will be next Saturday, so I want to share that with the with the church family. Before we get into our Bible class, I'd like for us to pray. Uh, several prayer requests. I like to add on 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 this prayer. This is our our prayer. Every Bible class is to pray for our efforts as a church, as we you know encourage or edify one another, as we reach out to lost souls, and as we our God's benevolent hand as we are zealous of good works and doing good to others, especially those who um, are in need. But I also want to add in our prayers, uh, Baby Amos, um, if you're following on Facebook, uh, they gave an update, update number eight. Uh, he, was, he was up and he was, uh, 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 up. I wouldn't say playing with dad because he seemed upset in the video when, when dad held a balloon in his face, he smacked it out of the way. Um, but uh, that's a good sign that he's, he's, he looks, looks like he's improving, but he has a, a long journey to go. And so pray for him uh, as he deals with cancer at such a young age. Um, and also pray for um, Rebecca uh, and Jordan Bennett, uh, who recently lost their baby at birth. Um, Rebecca is the daughter of Ben May. He was our former minister. So remember the May and Bennett family in our prayers, and we'll pray for them in this prayer. But also pray for uh, Julia Clark. I received news this morning from uh, Cheryl that uh, Charles Heath passed away. Um, last time we had an update, he was in hospice, and, and I don't know when he passed, uh, but let's pray for comfort. Uh, for his sister, Julia. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, and we recognize, Father, that you are the only true God. You are the God of love, mercy, and grace, the God of truth and justice, the God of all comfort. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being called your children and the blessing that we have in prayer to talk to you anytime we want, to make known what, what's on our hearts, even though you know, Father, but to show our dependence on you, that we need you in our lives. Father, we pray special prayers for the May and Bennett family. Please be with Rebecca and Jordan as they suffer through this difficult time, as they mourn the loss of their baby, baby Lincoln, Father, we know that baby is safe in your arms, and they know this too, and they know that one day they will be reunited with him. But Lord, comfort them during these times, and every time they are reminded, and every time they need comfort, we know, Father, you are the God of all comfort. Please be with them. Father, we also pray for Julia Clark as she mourns the loss of her brother, Charles, we pray, Father, your blessing upon her and their family. Comfort her as well, Lord, with the comfort that you comfort us with when we go through challenges. And Father, please be with her during these times. Father, we also pray for baby Amos 
as he's fighting for his life and for his family as they wait for improvement and good news. We're thankful, Father, for the small wins that we've got to see. But Lord, we know the journey is long for a baby. Father, you are the great physician. Please may it be your will to heal him completely, Lord, and to use him in your kingdom. Father, there are many others on our prayer list that are in need. Please provide them with what they need, Lord, if it be your will. Father, we thank you for your church, the pillar and ground of the truth, the light in the community of this dying world. Remind us, Lord, of who we are, to walk according to your word, to walk in the light as you are in the light, to live in such a way that we are a light to those who are in darkness. Father, we thank you for those who had the courage to evangelize, for those who took the time to teach us your will, to warn us about wrath to come, to share with us the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Bless them, Lord, if they, if they are still living. Give them strength and energy so they can continue to win more souls to your kingdom. But we also pray, Lord, that you use us as vessels of honor to reach lost souls, to share the gospel with those who are in need, to be that light in this world. We also pray, Father, for our efforts to encourage one another. Help us to realize that about the body of Christ, that we should have a constant care and concern for one another, whether it be physical or spiritual, Lord. Help us to be mindful of each other and help us to be humble enough to ask for help to put aside our pride, to swallow our pride, and to ask of our family in Christ for help when in need. Father, we pray also for our efforts to be your benevolent hand, to bless those who are without, to do good to all men, especially them of the household of faith. Thank you for your word. It is our guide in this life into the next. Be with us now as we open your holy word, guide our hearts and our minds, mold our hearts so that we can mold our person to be more like your son, Jesus. Thank you for the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Without him, Lord, we would be nothing. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers and for answering all of our prayers. May your will be done. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. We are in Acts chapter 12. And this will be our last time uh, in verses 1 through 4. Um, we have been emphasizing uh, part of, of chapter 12 there. concerning persecution and our thought of application was what do you need when you are persecuted right what do you need in times of trial and tribulation and i won't comment on that anymore we spent two classes on that and and in times of trials our sermon this morning will also help with with that lesson but I want us to highlight another part of, of, of this section of Scripture, and I already boded that for us. That's in verse 3, where it says of Herod, And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, he killed James, beheaded James, the brother of John. And he saw that he gained favor with the Jews for it. 
And so he wanted to continue to please them. And I think you kind of know already where we're headed with this bolded statement. Uh, the idea of pleasing man versus pleasing God. Right? Pleasing men versus pleasing God. I like to make people happy. All right. I like to do I think you like to do that too. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and do it in a good sense and with a good heart. It's something that we naturally like to do as people. When you help someone, it's gratifying. It's rewarding. You get to see a smile on your face. When you do something like that, it motivates you to do more of it. Right. And it's important to mind the motives behind what we do, which is where I kind of want to take us, first of all, uh, in this thought with Pharaoh or with uh, not Pharaoh, but Herod, different ruler. But with Herod, right, his idea of being pleasing to people uh, was sinful. Uh, his idea of pleasing people was against God's will. He was hurting the church. He killed the Christian to please the non-Christians, or uh, put it plainly, the enemies of Christ. These Jews were not God's people. They were enemies of Christ, all right? And so our, our uh, application, first of all, is why do we do the things we do in our lives? And I want to highlight doing good. Why do you want to do good? Do you want to do good to please men? Or do you want to do good to please God? Which is it? All right? And I want us to go to Matthew chapter 6 to begin with. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mountain, emphasized in this chapter uh, the importance of motive. That you can do something good and it all be in vain because the motive is wrong, right? And, and so you, we, we could certainly deal, and we do certainly deal with the temptation of pleasing men or with the temptation of, of pleasing self. But notice what Jesus said in these three categories. The first one is doing good deeds. The second is, um, is prayer. And the third is fasting. And there's one main point is, the point is, do it for God, not for men. All right? So notice that, first of all, Jesus in verse 1 of chapter 6, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Oh, I pause there. So he's saying, don't do good just to be seen. Now, there's a balance here. Right, You don't want to go to the other extreme where you end up not doing any good because some people might see it. Right, There's a balance. Right, It's important that the people of the world know that there's good in this world. It's important for them to see that there's, there are good people in this world. Right, And so what Jesus is not saying, he's not saying, don't do good publicly. That's not what he's saying. He's, he's saying, don't do good in the out there in the public or in private for the praises of men. That's what he's saying. Right? So I wanted to highlight that. There's a balance. Uh, we don't want to go to the extreme that we're not doing good at all. Right? So uh, uh, notice that Jesus said, Take heed that you not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward uh, from your Father in heaven. Uh, back up with me to Matthew chapter 5. Notice verse 13. What did he say there? He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be drawn out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. What do we know about the concept of light? All right? Light is used to what? To help you see better. 
Right when it's dark and you and you have six kids and you walk around in dark in your house and you step on a Lego piece. Right? That will hurt. And then you'll learn your lesson. Turn the lights on. Right? Lights help you see better. Right? And so notice what Jesus says in Matthew 5 does not contradict what he says in Matthew 6. Right? You have to be the light. And how do you do that? Go out there and be good. And do good to people. And do it for his glory. Not for man. Right? He continues on. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a lampstand. Or, or, or put it under a basket. But on a lampstand. That it gives light to all who are in the world. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And glorify your father in heaven. So it's a matter of why are you doing it? Why? All right. Is it possible for you to have good motives in doing good out there and someone reads it the wrong way? Right? That you're out there doing good and someone says, Well, look, he just wants attention. That's on them. Right? That's on them. That's not on you. Continue to do good. If you know you're doing it for the Lord, don't stop. Even if there's criticism, even if there's complaints about you, even if there's people who misread your actions, even if the person you're doing good to misreads your actions, do good anyway. Right? And do it with the right motive. Back to verse 6. Right? So the, I mean, chapter 6. So there's that balance. Notice verse 2. It's about motive. He says, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street, that they may have glory from them. Who do they want to please? All right. The things that they do, the, the, the hypocrites, the Pharisees and the scribes, who are they trying to please? Men. All right. His motive. Kind of like Herod. Who was he trying to please? It's kind of interesting. Right? He's not, in a sense, is he persecuting Christians because they are Christians, or he's just persecuting them because he has favor from the Jews? All right? Jesus says, um, um, verse 3, But when you do your charitable deed, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. What's the motive? Right. What's the motive behind it? Notice verse five. Now he talks about prayer. Right. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they're um, that they have their reward. Is it wrong to play out and to pray out in the corner of the streets? No, it's motive. It's wrong if you're doing it to say, look, I'm a religious person. Look, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm praying religiously. All right? Uh, one of the ways you can shine your light, and, and this is something I, I do, and I, and, I don't, and I don't think about it. It just naturally comes to me, is, is when I'm in a restaurant and I pray for my food. I just pray for my food. Yeah, I don't care what you're doing there, if you're watching or what. I just pray for my food. Because it naturally comes to me. It naturally comes to you. Don't, don't decide, well, I'm not going to pray for my food because people are watching me now. All right? It's okay to pray publicly. It's the motive that matters. Are you doing it to please men? Or are you doing it to please God? But when you pray, go into your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret in the secret in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, right? For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need before you ask of him. I want to skip down to that last part about fasting. So he talks about doing good out in the public. He talks about prayer. Now he talks about fasting. 
right? And and uh, who here knows about Ash Wednesdays, right? Ash Wednesdays is it's like a, a public declaration of fasting. Look at me, I'm fasting, right? Well, listen to what Jesus says. Moreover, when you fast, all right, so when you fast, is it okay for a Christian to fast? Yes. It's important to fast, especially if you're going to make an important decision in your life. Take time to meditate. Try to have some clarity of mind when you fast. Right? Sometimes you have to fast medicinally because it's good for your health and it's needed. Right? When you take your blood test or you have your blood drawn, sometimes they tell you to fast. All right? But it's okay for a Christian to fast. I just wanted to highlight that. But notice what, what Jesus says. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Wow, what a outward and detailed explanation. They do something to their faces so they appear to men as fasting. All right. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your feet so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father who is in secret place and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So in regards to praying, in regards to doing good, in regards to fasting, motive matters. right? And it's not wrong to do any of these things it's wrong to do it to gain attention for self. It's wrong to do it to be pleasing unto men and not unto God. Any thoughts on that before we move to the next scripture um, uh, this morning? Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we'll bring the mic uh, to you. So in my line of work, I take clients out for meals all the time, right? A couple times a month, you know. And when I first started um, taking clients out, I never used to pray for my food. And growing up, my grandmother always used to tell us, if you don't pray for your food, you will, be, you will get sick, right? So if you're a kid and you think that, you, you believe it. Um, and then one day I just kind of said, you know what? I didn't even think about it. The food came and I prayed. It was with a, a bunch of men, no, no women, just a bunch of men. And when I bowed my head to pray, um, one other man bowed his head as well. The rest of them just started eating. Mm -hmm. And no one said anything. And after that, I did it every time. So I don't, it, like you said, it's just a natural thing. I just do it. I don't even think about it. The food comes. I pray because I do it everywhere I go. And um, and now when I go out with people, um, clients, friends, whomever, um, no one even bats an eye. Actually, a lot of them stop talking while I'm praying. I don't pray out loud, but they stop talking while I'm praying and wait for me to finish. So, yeah. And you and you appreciate that when they recognize it, and you gave them something to think about, right? Uh, and that's that's when you're out there. That's way. That's one of the ways we shine our light. Uh, we're in the same line of work. I I eat with clients every uh, month or so. <laughs> I call them prospects. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, it's it, You know, I mean, you don't do it just to 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 put everybody else on the table in an awkward position. Oh, he's praying for his food. What do we do now? You know. Uh, you just do it because it shows you're thankful to God uh, for for the meal that he's prepared. Sometimes, and, and I'll admit to this, sometimes I eat and forget to pray, right? And so, and so I'll pray after I eat. When I remember to to to, when I forget to 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 pray before I eat, I'll pray after I eat, right? And it's not like your prayer would be void because you didn't pray before you eat, right? It's just the attitude of thanksgiving, 
and to always be thankful for God's blessings. Um, Yona, go ahead. The motive for practicing our righteousness is to please God. I think about Saul and his approval of Stephen when Stephen was martyred. He was sincere, although misguided. And Herod, his motivation is popularity, political motive. The better motive was Saul's one, you know, although misguided, but, you know, ultimately our motivation should be to please God. Absolutely. I, I like what you highlighted there, Yona. Um, it is possible to do something with your, with your uh, uh, heart in the right place saying, I'm doing this for you, God, and it be wrong. <laughs> right? Like you can have the right motive and the wrong action. Right? Hey, think about it this way, um, in worshiping God. Right? How many... Right now, in our as we talk, how many are sincere in their gathering in some places on this island to worship God? I tell you, there are a lot of sincere people, right? But the actions they take in their approach to worship God is wrong, right? And and so it matters, right? Because we read in John chapter four when Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman brought up the topic of worship. Uh, our father says we worship on this mountain. And you, Jew, says worship is in Jerusalem, in Mount Zion, where the temple is. Right? And that was true under the old law that God was worshipped where the temple was, in Mount Zion, right, in Jerusalem. But remember what Jesus said in, in, in response to the woman. He said, uh, but believe me, you, the hour is coming where you will neither worship God on this mountain or in Jerusalem, right? For God desires true worshipers. And then he says, uh, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him this way, in spirit, to have the right attitude, and thanksgiving, in reverence, paying homage to God, Um in a broken and contrite spirit, approaching God. It's like to have the right spirit. But then the second part is what? In truth. To have the right teachings. Right? Because truth sanctifies us. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Truth makes us free. John 8, verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth purifies us seeing that you have obeyed the truth in sincere love of the brethren, Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 21, 22, right? So, so yes, I, I like the point that, that Yonah brought up there. Like Saul, he was sincere, right? Even Jesus prophes prophesied about Saul to his disciples that there will be one who thinks he's doing what, what is good before God, but he's not. Right, and that was Saul of Tarsus. And he learned, and he changed, and then he dedicated his life in service to God. Go ahead, Pat. We'll bring the mic to Pat. Thank you, Mana. When we are in a noisy situation, especially in restaurants, I think the best way to do it would be silently doing it because you cannot see amen to a prayer where you cannot hear. True. Um, true. And I mean, the, the scenario would dictate, um, if you know me, I'm pretty loud. And if people are, are on the table, I want to make sure if we're all praying together that everybody hears that prayer. Uh, so like, like Pat says, so that, when we say amen, everybody knows the prayer ended. Uh, sometimes in a setting like that, uh, um, like I would ask uh, my son to pray, and sometimes he's not loud, and and so he amen his prayer, and we're still, we're still waiting, you know, and then he goes, I already said amen, All right, and so so situation dictates, right, and and. Uh, I'm not here giving you a command 
that you should pray publicly for your food loudly, <laughs> right? I'm just here highlighting one of the ways we shine our lights is when we're out there in public being God's people and it's just naturally your habit to pray for your food. Now you can pray silently or you can pray how you normally pray. That's up to you, right? Um, we'll, we'll go to Will and then we'll, we'll look at the next scripture here about pleasing men, right? Just to add to what we were talking, usually when I'm with friends or family, I would acknowledge them, oh, can we pray first before we eat? So that's what I do. I usually acknowledge that so they know, you know, to thank God for all the food that we have and all that. So that's what I usually do, and they usually agree to it, and even though they don't pray, right? So but for my case, I, I say we should pray. I mean, in, in that scenario, Will, has anyone said to you, no, let's not pray, right? People generally say, that's okay. Even, even if they're an atheist, you know, they, they, they will say, that's okay. Well, yeah, let's pray. And that, that by asking them, is it okay if I lead us in a prayer over the food? That, that makes it less awkward, <laughs> right? Uh, what would what 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 makes it um, awkward? And you know, when we're out in public, you'll run into awkward situations, right? It's just reality, right? What what makes it awkward sometimes is if you're in a table, and then and then um, you want to pray for your food, and it's not wrong, okay? It's awkward, but it's not wrong. I right? understand that, okay? Because because it it just it just makes other people feel different, right? Like if you don't if like say. I'm with five strangers and we're at a table and we're eating a meal, a meal and the meal comes and I don't say anything to them. And then I just started praying for my food, you know, and then slowly they'll recognize that I've been praying. Right. Um, so, so definitely they might feel awkward about that. Right. You may not feel awkward about it, but by asking them, is it okay if I lead us in a word of prayer? It makes the situation more smooth, right? And most people do not reject to it. Um, um, but don't 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 say that Lima said they will never reject it. So because you might run into that one individual that you say, is it okay if I lead us in a prayer? And they say, No, it's not okay. Right? I haven't had that happen to me, but it's possible it can happen to you. Go ahead, Brent. I, I just want to add uh uh, which uh, Tavanas mentioned about the grandmother and the granddaughter thingy, because I am also guilty with that. You know, sometimes it's it takes a little wisdom and uh, yeah. Well, so uh, one day when uh, my daughter was just baptized and the, the Davidson invited us for a dinner or. To, to celebrate uh, Nina's decision to obey the gospel. And uh, of course, my son would ask, hey, Dad, what's the occasion? And he said, oh, we are invited because they want to celebrate with us. Your uh, sister just got baptized and said, oh, I want to get baptized too. I want to get baptized too. <laughs> and uh, oh, you, you don't understand yet. I do. I understand. They go into water and dip down there. And then they said, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus. So. It's not only like that, I said. Uh, they need to oh, understand the Bible and obey it. What about if the Bible said, cut your hair every month? Do you want it? And I know uh, my, my son hate, really hates uh, you know, a haircut. So by those kind of, of uh, reasoning with, with the young ones, you need to get down as much as their level to for them to understand things and so yeah grandmas and granddaughter things and I, I know I don't know if it is wrong or right but I lean on to uh, it is right for that age uh, but then don't forget to remind them as they grow definitely um evangelism tip if you're out in the public maybe you're with family maybe you're with religious family Right, family that are religious, um, and, and this has happened to me. Um, and you sat down on the table, and you know what the Bible says about uh, leader, lead, leaders, right? That 
the, the, the men are to leave, right? And you're with your religious family, and, and let's say one of your aunties, she is a church goer, and you sit down, and she leads the prayer over the food, and you're the man on that table, and you are a Christian, and, and she leads the prayer over the food. Don't make it a point of contention. Let them lead the prayer. You pray with them, right? Um, um, sometimes to the ruining of relationships, some have objected and insisted that because I'm the Christian on this table, I should lead the, the prayer, right? Um, doctrinally right, but tactfully not wise, right? And the reason why it's not wise is your religious auntie, who is not a member of the body, she she doesn't know the truth, right? And so you need to be willing to put that on the shelf for a discussion later on, right? So some evangelism too, right? Because because uh, that has happened to me multiple times with family members, um, even with my own mom. Uh, before she became a Christian, when my mom, when she lived with us for for uh, several months, um, uh, she would she would, you know, automatic because it's her practice. She's a praying woman, and we sat at the table before I got to it. She said, "Well, let's pray, right?" And so I'm not going to be like, "Well, mom, no, no, no." In this house, I lead the prayers. I'm not going to do that because she doesn't know. I know it. And so I'm going to put that conversation on the shelf and we can have that conversation later, right? And so just some, some evangel evangelism tip there uh, if you're out with family and if you're put in that position, um, I'll tell you what, if you insist on leading that prayer, you're going to make that whole thing awkward. It's going to be awkward. And that person is going to leave that, that table wondering, why did he let me say the prayer? You know, or I don't get it. He, I mean, he insisted on it. Well, what was what was up with him? <laughs> right. So, so yeah. Just a just side note there uh, on um, on on those type of situation. Go with me to John chapter twelve. Right. So in in prayers, in doing good, in fasting, my motive matters. I got to do it for God. Here is another example in Scripture where. There were those who understand the truth, who knew the truth, but they wanted to please men instead of pleasing God, right? Notice here, very sad, John chapter 12. I want to begin from verse 37. Verse 37. John 12, verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39, therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke to him. Notice this, verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers Many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue for their motive, for they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. But notice how dangerous this is, right? You're talking about people who got to see the miracles of Jesus, who got to hear the master teacher teach, who got to live in the time when God walked the earth and to believe in him, right? To believe, because you cannot deny the signs, right? And in Acts chapter 3, we, we read about that. The Pharisees and the scribes, could not deny the man that was at the gate called beautiful. They could not deny the signs. They said it themselves. For we cannot deny the sign that has been done. So they believed in Jesus. 
But notice what they want. All right? They want the praises of men more than the praises of God. What a sound commentary that is. All right? To know the truth, to see the truth, only to say, I, I like my position in my job. I like where I'm at. And I know that if I confess Jesus, I risk losing all of the prestige. I risk losing, you know, the 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 sitting at the best seats in the feast. Uh, that was the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the chief rulers of the synagogue. There was a certain privilege. There was a certain pres uh, prestige attached to them being the rulers of synagogue. And because they fear the Pharisees and the scribe who really had the power to put them out. If you follow this man, you will put out, be put out of your position. Because they fear men more than they fear God. They would not confess Jesus. Right? So again, motive. The motive. Who do they want to please? Well, in this instant, themselves. Right? There's some self-pleasure here. Right? Being a ruler of the synagogue. Enjoying the privileges of, of being that in that position. Even among the Pharisees and the scribes. Having the position of Power, right? Power can corrupt, right? Power can be good if used rightly, but power can absolutely corrupt a person. And so here is an instant. Some believe Jesus, but they will not confess him because they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. Now, I want to, I want to flip this uh, uh, and apply it in evangelism because this is something I, I, I have seen in the people I, I have studied with who have not obeyed the gospel, right? When they learn the truth and then they realize something to this effect, well, my dad didn't do this or my mom didn't do this. Right? Or so-and-so didn't know this, this truth that you're teaching me, Lee. And so it's, it's difficult for me to obey this because my family, they believe a certain way. And so because I was born this way and I will die this way, I will not obey the gospel. And that's so sad. And I've seen that uh, multiple times studying with people. They're staring right at the truth. Their eyes are bawling out with tears. They're reading it. And then they say no. And then they reject. Right? Well, who do we think they're pleasing there? Right? Well, one, you can say self. The idea of not wanting to change. Right? Change is hard. Or a pleasing family. Well, I don't want my family to kick me out. Because now I'm going to follow this way versus our family way. Right? How many of you, both generations back in your family, where the, your family was a certain, uh, 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 was part of a certain denomination? We we'll go way back. Uh, my my family, my grandfather was a preacher of the Methodist Church, and so we go way back in the Methodist Church. And my father used to say this of me. He says, "One day you will be a preacher just like my grandfather." And he was thinking Methodist Church. All right. Sometimes I I think about him saying that, and sometimes I cry because. You know, I wish, I wish that he knew. I wish that he could see that I did become a preacher. But a preacher of the gospel. 
There's so many people like this. Uh, I want us to go to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 10, and we'll close off with this. Matthew chapter 10. And this is a hard passage to deal with, but when when I'm when when someone is is not when they know the truth and they're not making the decision they know to make, and when they say that family is in the way, I take them here. In Matthew chapter ten, it's not a pleasant scripture to read, but it's a powerful one. All right, Matthew ten. Notice beginning in verse thirty four. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So, so let's talk about what Jesus is not saying, right? He is not saying that his intention is to divide families. He's not saying that. Because if if your family would follow the truth, oh, the beautiful unity within the family. The beautiful relationships, because your family follows the truth. But what he is saying is this. If you follow the truth and your family doesn't, there will be division. There will be division. There will be some harsh disagreements to the point where you they don't want to be family uh, anymore with you or you with them. And that's challenging. All right. Uh, our, uh, I'm going to tell you how serious Athena and I are about this. Everything that we have in our name, even our kids, will not go um, to to uh, uh, members of our family, of our blood family. It's going to a faithful Christian brother and sister in Christ. Um, now, my mom just recently got baptized, and my sister is also member of the church. But they're still, you know, new to the faith, and they're still facing some challenges. Something, God forbid, something happens to me, everything we have in our name, even our life insurance, it does not go to any blood relative. It goes to faithful members of the body. And that's how serious we are. Because we know our kids, we cannot leave our kids to those who are not faithful to the Lord. And that includes blood relatives. This is how serious it is. Because they can lead them out of Christ. And we cannot afford that as parents. Right? And, and so, what Jesus says here, the gospel, if not everyone in the family obeys it, it will divide. It will cause challenges in the relationship. He, he continues on. Verse 37. He who loves father more, father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Notice how serious that is. And so I would plead with this person. I need you to understand what Jesus is saying. Do what pleases God. Trust God. Who knows? And I tell them this. Who knows? You may be here for your family. You are the one to lead your family to the cross. Right. We'll continue our, we're out of time, but any, any final thoughts before we conclude this morning? Greg, and we'll bring the mic to Greg. I just want to extend on what Yona said earlier about Saul and how dedicated, if you will, people assume that they are to God 
in reference to Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever, or Joel Osteen on TV, you know, who are these people really trying to impress? And I believe the gentleman on TV is all about the people liking him. Now, it's unfortunate that the Methodists, such as you mentioned in your own family, they truly believe they are doing the right thing. <clears throat> and, you know, their buildings are a lot of times way more full than ours. And the road is definitely narrow, but we have to believe as Christians ourselves, we may be the one. We may hold the one tool that turns them to Christ. And we can never, we can never forget that. We, we are here for a reason, and that sole reason could be to turn that one person over to Christ. Absolutely. We are, we are saved to serve. Right? We are saved to serve, not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Father, for the reminder from the scriptures to always make it our goal and our motivation to please you. And so we are gathered here, Lord, with that purpose to please you by learning more of your will and in a few minutes by worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Please be with our family that are not with us this morning. Whatever their needs may be, Father, bless them and bring them back to us. Thank you for Jesus. It is through his name we pray. Amen.